Hey everyone, Darren Burrows here. Today I want to walk you through a strategy called house hacking. House hacking has become very popular with the rise of real estate pricing over the last few years. It's also gained traction because of the need for smaller housing stock and people generally feel like they need less stuff and less space. Affordability has also become a major issue as we're seeing our affordability index in places like Toronto and Vancouver push to between 66 and 81% respectively, which means that in Toronto, 66% of the money that people earn is going towards paying for their living expenses. And this doesn't leave a lot left over for things like food, transportation, clothing, entertainment, and in my case, red wine. Even outside of these major centers, affordability can range anywhere between 35 and 45%. And if 40% of your income is going towards your housing costs, you can see why house hacking has become so popular as a way to either reduce your living expenses and be able to earn less money or to be able to retire early and reach your financial goals just that much faster. So I wanna walk you through how house hacking actually works, show you some actual numbers on a deal that I'm working on right now, and break down the pros and the cons of this strategy. So now, without further ado, let's get into it. First off, what is house hacking? House hacking is a strategy that involves renting out portions of your primary residence to generate income that can then offset your mortgage and other expenses associated with owning a home. Some of you might be willing to take this strategy to extreme levels in order to be able to save as much money as possible. For instance, you could rent rooms in your house, you could do short-term Airbnb rentals, you could convert your garage to living space and rent that out. Or as I saw at one of my friend's places the other day, you could put a Yeti tent in the backyard and rent that out and then have somebody use the house just for cooking and cleaning. Most of these ideas wouldn't fly for me because I really like to have my own space but it's really about your own personal comfort level and what you're hoping to achieve in terms of your financial goals. But for simplicity, let's look at the most common scenario, which is purchasing a multi-unit property or purchasing a property and converting it to multiple units. The first time I house hacked, I bought a triplex and I renovated it and made it a nicer and legal triplex. And then I rented out two of the other apartments and I got paid essentially to live there each month. Generally speaking, the more units that you have in the property, the better chance you have of actually getting paid to live in your space like I was. Before we jump into an example like that, let me show you how this can work on a property we recently purchased and are converting to two units. We purchased this house in Hamilton, Ontario from a wholesaler for $425,500. And if you're interested in learning more about how to buy properties from wholesalers, you can check out this video right here. This house was outdated and needed some mostly cosmetic renovations, both upstairs and downstairs in the basement. So let's say that I was planning to live in this property as a single family dwelling after completing those cosmetic renovations, both upstairs and downstairs. As I mentioned earlier, we purchased the property for $425,500. The closing costs are about $7,500 and a renovation of that scope for the upstairs and downstairs work combined would be about $50,000. So our total at this point into the transaction would be $483,000. One of the first benefits of house hacking is the amount of money that lenders will usually let you put down. Because this is going to be your primary residence and owner occupied, lenders often give the most preferential rates and terms on those kinds of mortgages. And why is that? Well, because the banks know that if you have multiple properties and things start to go wrong, the first payment that you're going to make every single month is going to be on your primary residence and the property that you live in. Because of that, lenders are usually willing to go to a higher loan to value ratio and allow for a lower down payment. If we have that $425,000 property, we have to put 10% down versus the normal 20% down that's required with rental properties. We only need capital of $42,000 on a down payment at 10% versus $85,000 on a 20% down payment. So we need less capital into the transaction or this allows us to buy a higher priced asset. The downside to this is if we have a smaller down payment, we're gonna have a higher mortgage amount and a higher mortgage payment. If we take that 10% down on that $425,000 property, our mortgage would be $382,950. And if we amortize that over 25 years at 3% interest, our mortgage payments would be about $1,800 per month. For simplicity, let's say that our other expenses on the property are gonna add up to about 3% of the purchase price on an annual basis. These would include taxes, utilities, insurance, and repairs and maintenance. At 3% of the purchase price on an annual basis, our other expenses would add up to about $1,050 per month. Let's also say that we're gonna take that $50,000 needed for renovation, and we're gonna put that on a line of credit at 8% interest. If we made interest-only payments on that line of credit, 
our additional expenses would be $325 per month. So if we take our $1,800 for a mortgage payment, we add in our $1,050 for our expenses, our $325 for our line of credit payment, we end up with total living expenses of $3,175 on a monthly basis. If we go back to that affordability index and say that we need to allocate 40% of our monthly expenses to living, that would mean we'd need to make $95,000 per year in order to be able to afford that house. Let's look at the house hacking alternative on this same $425,000 house, but instead of finishing the basement, let's convert the basement to a legal basement apartment and rent it out. We're still gonna use that 10% down payment number because this is still our principal residence and an owner occupied unit. So our mortgage is still $382,950, which works out to about $1,800 per month. We'll keep that same 3% of the purchase price for our annual expenses. You might argue that our expenses are going to go up because we have more people in the property, so our utility costs might be higher, and maybe our property taxes would also go up. I would argue the opposite, that you could actually reduce your expenses because if you're doing this properly while you're renovating, you could separate out the utilities and the tenants could pay their own utilities, or you write it into the lease agreement that they're responsible for half the utilities that are on the house. But for now, let's keep it exactly the same that it's that $1,050 on a monthly basis for your expenses. The renovation capital, however, has jumped to $80,000 from $50,000. So if we're putting that $80,000 on a line of credit and we're paying 8% interest, interest only payments, our monthly payment would be about $525 per month. So now our mortgage payment is $1,800 a month. Our expenses are $1,050 per month and our line of credit payment is $525 per month. Our total expenses on a monthly basis now are $3,375 monthly. Because we've divided the property into two separate units, now we can rent out one of those two units. So we can either rent the basement at $1,400 a month or the upstairs at $2,000 a month. So let's say we rent out our basement at $1,400 a month. We take that $3,375, we subtract $1,400, and we're left with $1,975 coming out of our pocket every single month. If we go back to the affordability, we need to allocate 40% of our $1,975 for living expenses. That means that we now have to make $59,000 a year instead of $95,000 per year. If you still made that $95,000 per year, your living expenses now drop to 25% of your overall expenses instead of that 40 like we had earlier. But wait, what if you were willing to live in the basement and rent out the main floor? What would that look like? If we rent out the main floor for $2,000 a month, we now take our $33.75 for our monthly expenses, we subtract the $2,000 a month we're getting for rent, and we're left with $1,375 coming out of our pocket every single month. If we go back to the affordability at 40% and we have $1,375 of expenses per month, now we only need to make $41,000 per year to be able to keep up with that 40% number. And if you're still making $95,000 a year, your living expenses drop to 17.5% of your overall expenses versus 40% in the first model. So you can see how house hacking can significantly impact the amount of money that you need to make or the rate at which you can save money to get your financial goals just that much faster. But wait, there's more. And I suddenly feel like the ShamWow guy. There's another benefit, tax write-offs. Because now that a section of your home is considered a rental property, you can write off a portion of your mortgage interest, your expenses, and your interest that you're paying on your line of credit to finance the renovation. So this further helps reduce the amount of money that you need to earn or increases the amount of money that you get to save. But wait, there's even more. And now I really feel like the sham wow guy. You can also repeat this process over and over again. So I buy a property with 10% down because it's gonna be my principal residence. I then renovate the basement to make it a legal suite and I rent out the basement. Let's say I stay there for a year or two and after two years, I decide to repeat this process again. Well, now I go and buy another property. That property is now going to be my principal residence so I can put a lower down payment on it. And now I rent out the space that I used to be in and that house now has positive cash flow. And if you're not sure how to calculate positive cash flow, check out this video right here to make sure you're including all the right expenses. So now that I have this new property, it's considered my primary residence and I do the same thing. I renovate it, make it a legal duplex. I rent out the basement. I live in it for a while upstairs. I rent out the downstairs. Now I can go and buy another property, put 10% down because that one's gonna be my principal residence and I rent out the other property that I used to live in. And you see how you can use this strategy to start to build your real estate investing portfolio.
And this is the fastest way that you can grow your real estate portfolio without having to put a lot of money down into each transaction. And there's one more thing that I wanna show you and that's how if you do this properly, you can actually get paid to live in your property every single month or at least have your living expenses be zero dollars. And it's relatively simple to be able to do this. You just need to increase your unit count. So instead of a duplex, now you need to start looking at triplexes or fourplexes. So let me walk you through the very first property that I house hacked here in Toronto. I bought this house in 2007 for $395,000. Now I know that this is not a realistic price point in the Toronto market right now, but you'll see that the rents at the time were reflective of the purchase price. As I mentioned, I bought the property for $395,000. It was an illegal triplex. So I converted it to a legal triplex and that cost me $100,000 for the renovation. I put 10% down and I had a mortgage of $355,500 and at 3% interest, my mortgage payments were about $1,680 per month. I'll use that same 3% of the purchase price for my annual expenses. So my monthly expenses were about $985. And the $100,000 I needed for the renovation capital, I put on a line of credit. I was paying 8% interest only payments, which works out to about $650 a month. My $1,680 for my mortgage, my $985 for my expenses, and my $625 for my line of credit payment added up to $3,315 per month of expenses. I had a one bedroom apartment in the basement and I had a one bedroom plus den on the main floor. The basement was renting for $1,200 and the main floor was renting for $2,000. So those two combined, I was bringing in $3,200 a month in rent. My $3,315 in expenses subtract my $3,200 in rent and I was out of pocket $115 per month. When I factor in that two thirds of the property was being used as a rental and I could write off those expenses, I was actually making money every single month. And now you can see why this strategy is so effective in being able to reduce your living expenses or to reduce your living expenses and be able to save just that much faster and get you to your financial goals just that much quicker. But I will be honest with you, it's not all sunshine and roses. There are some downsides to house hacking. You do have to deal with tenants and you will be living in a shared space. So there's sometimes some sound transfer and maybe you have some outdoor space that you might have to share with your tenants as well. But all in all, I think the benefits far outweigh the downsides and that's why I'm such a huge fan of this strategy. If you like this strategy as well, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success in your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.